The story begins with the protagonist's recollections of his father's words, live for your clan, which his father always emphasized. The message was clear he shouldn't harbor ambitions and shouldn't linger in the shadow of his brother. We witness a man on his knees, seemingly awaiting the consequences of his defeats. Someone approaches, contemplating the sight of the completely defeated young man. The situation involves a knight fighting alone against the continent's strongest commanders. As the man surveys the corpses, a man with an air of superiority approaches, smiling. The man introduces himself as Boris, and the defeated youth is called Cyan Vert. Boris wears a sadistic smile as Cyan inquires about who ordered him to do such a thing. Cyan begins to summon an enchanted sword, surrounded by a dark energy flowing through his body. He asks if the emperor was the one who ordered it. Boris, recognizing the dark energy, acknowledges Cyan as the brother of a certain man, finding it quite interesting. Cyan, now known as the Mist Assassin, gains demonic power and presence. Boris explains that the Mist is an organization, a shadow to the Knights of Light. He claims credit for eliminating an impure being affiliated with the pagans. Cyan challenges Boris to go ahead and report it to his superiors if he still has a mouth after their fight. He vows to leave Boris with no teeth once he's done. Boris warns Cyan that using his secret power is futile due to a four-star magical barrier. However, Boris appears less confident, contemplating how to escape at any cost. Cyan, overflowing with power, threatens to tear the barrier into pieces. A commanding figure intervenes, telling Cyan to stop. The presence leaves Cyan bewildered and without his will. He recalls his father's words about Ashel Vert, an extension of the clan, and realizes that Ashel's success is also his. Ashel, in high-ranking armor, approaches and Cyan, already losing the will to fight, concludes that his brother Ashel is the mastermind behind it all. Ashel praises Cyan for serving the clan, the people, and himself well. Cyan is left in a whirlwind of thoughts, trying to make sense of the situation. Ashel accuses Cyan of being nothing more than an assassin, no longer human. Ashel claims that Cyan deceived them for long enough and questions if he even knows his sins. Cyan, furious and confused, demands an explanation. The narrative shifts to the battle for the Empire's succession, where everyone vies for the crown. Cyan claims to have helped Ashel achieve everything he has, having served him with his life for twenty years. Despite his sacrifice, Cyan feels abandoned and roars that he worked like a dog. Cyan, burning with power, vows to give it his all, even if it means breaking his own body. He mocks Ashel for attempting to kill his younger brother out of fear and questions his shame. As Cyan's supernatural power frightens the knights, he charges at Ashel, intending to hit his weak point. The clash between the brothers reveals Boris's interference, resulting in a precise strike that pierces Cyan's abdomen, confirming his defeat. Ashel reveals his true intentions, stating that he wanted to give Cyan a painless death as brothers, but inadvertently exposed his true nature. Ashel accuses Cyan of being a demon from the beginning, expressing relief that he never trusted him. Hurt by his brother's words, Cyan is kicked to the ground, contemplating his seemingly imminent demise. However, in a surprising turn of events, Cyan prepares to launch a final attack on Ashel. With a roar, he directs his knife towards Ashel's throat, but at the last moment, Ashel throws him away with a swing of his sword. Suddenly, everything goes dark, and all Cyan can hear is someone calling him. He wakes up in fear, hand on his neck. A young maid, Emily, asks how long he plans to sleep and urges him to get up and prepare. Startled by Emily's presence, he realizes it's been almost twenty years since he last saw her and she seems unchanged. Something strange dawns on him, he's back in the room where he lived as a child, and he realizes he has regressed to being a child himself. Emily scolds him for dawdling and instructs him to decide and go. Confused, Cyan questions Emily about the training she mentioned. As Cyan steps outside and sees the surroundings, he recognizes the Vert clan's base. Convinced he's back in the past at his clan's duchy, he wonders if this is some life-flashing-before-his-eyes moment. Cyan recalls an event from twenty years ago. 
a training duel in which his father, the Duke, participated, and he faced his half-brother, Krantz Vert. The duel ended in Cyan's humiliation, leading to his father's neglect. Emily questions why Cyan doesn't just surrender, but he brandishes his sword, determined to win. The weight of the foil feels real, and Cyan ponders whether this is a dream or if he's reliving the past. Facing Krantz, Cyan decides to change the future. The duel begins and Cyan effortlessly dodges Krantz's attacks, disarms him, and kicks him to the ground. The Duke and Duchess are surprised by Krantz's defeat. Cyan contemplates putting his sword to Krantz's throat to end the duel, but hesitates, feeling it's not enough. He recalls the childhood bullying from Krantz, who used to intimidate him for entertainment. Cyan prepares to deliver a decisive blow, intending to pave his own path. The duel concludes with Krantz defeated and humiliated. The Duke grants Cyan freedom, and Cyan wonders if his victory was that impressive. Elkin, a high-ranking knight, accompanies Cyan. On his way, Cyan encounters Krantz's mother, who insults him for beating her son. Despite the provocation, Cyan remains calm. The insults escalate, with Cyan contemplating revenge. He hints at attending the academy with Krantz, unsettling his stepmother. She insults him further, suggesting he should be begging on the streets. As Cyan contemplates whether to kill her, he decides against it, opting for a slow and careful revenge. He reveals his plan to torture her emotionally. When Cyan mentions attending the academy alongside Krantz, his stepmother questions his point. Cyan cryptically hints that she probably wanted her son to graduate with all his body parts intact. She reacts with hatred and Cyan, with a dark smile, plans to make her suffer slowly. Cyan reveals that he knows she wanted Krantz safe at the academy. His stepmother, furious, insults him again. As she raises her hand to strike him, Cyan's knight intervenes, apologizing and claiming urgent summons from the duke. The knight's serious gaze signals their departure, leaving Cyan's stepmother in silence. Cyan laughed under the knight's arm, stating that the duke's orders were absolute. He was being protected by a guardsman who had received that order. He was glad that a knight who didn't submit to the duke's wife, someone truly reliable, was on guard. Upon knocking on the door, the duke ordered them to enter. Cyan bowed and introduced himself as the youngest son of the Vert family. He then lowered his head in greeting, thinking that it had been fifteen years since they had recognized each other face to face. His father, Willius, glanced at him and asked him to sit. The great feudal lord of Velias, a western rival of the Ushif Empire, was known by a different name to the world the guardian of the continent. He was the hero who, with his remarkable magical power and worldly wisdom, had long prevented the demon's invasion. This man had taken on a responsibility that no one forced upon him until his death in the battle against the demon king's army. All he wanted was peace throughout the continent, but memories of him differed significantly from the reality. Soon, he sat in front of his father with impeccable posture. As he looked at his father, he pondered how he used his free will to spend his entire life serving others a foolish man in his opinion. Willius told Cyan that his eyes precisely followed the sword and dodged it, leaving his son impressed. His father observed that at the moment Krantz rushed towards him, he looked directly at the swinging sword's path and turned his body to avoid it. Willius asked how he learned to handle a sword, and Cyan replied that he wouldn't say he learned. He practiced alone every night. But inwardly, he thought about how clever he was. His father asked what he trained for, knowing his son had no interest in fencing. So why did he hide such excellent skills? Cyan scratched his head, embarrassed, and said he just didn't want to draw everyone's attention. However, his father said that despite that, he didn't go easy on Krantz. But he questioned whether what he did afterward was unnecessary, referring to the kicks he gave his brother. Cyan seemed tense, wondering about the intent behind that question. It seemed quite perceptive. He wondered if his father was trying to get an idea of what he was capable of. Cyan then said he wanted to prove his worth, and his father asked what he was talking about. Cyan said he meant being better than Krantz, even though they shared the same blood. That was the conclusion he reached for himself after the duel. 
Soon, Cyan was surprised by his father's reaction. His father smiled proudly, as it was a clear and concise answer that showed his balance. His father said he didn't know he was so talented, it was a pleasure for him. He mentioned that Cyan would become a great support for Ashel one day, but that shocked Cyan, wondering why he would become his assistant. Cyan saw in his father's eyes that he hadn't changed at all. He was still obsessed with his eldest son Ashel. Cyan clenched his fist, and his father said it wasn't exactly a trophy but wanted to reward him for that duel. Then he said that if Cyan wanted something, he could say it without hesitation. But Cyan already had a determined look. He intended to destroy everything. Everything his brother tried to do, and then he decided what he wanted to ask for. Later, we see his maid completely flustered because he asked to enter the battlefield. Cyan calmly confirms that she heard right, though nothing was certain yet. The young maid, Emily, asks if he's out of his mind, and if he has any idea what kind of place it is. She describes it as a location teeming with demonic, wicked and terrifying beasts everywhere. In old terms, it was the western rival of the Ushif Empire, the only place on the entire continent called the Front Lines. Even within that, the Lemia Valley, which could be called the Front Line, is a ferocious battlefield where battles with demons have been happening for hundreds of years. Cyan mentions that because of this, his father, who vehemently opposed it from the beginning, gave him a condition. Within a month, Cyan had to prove himself worthy of going to the Lemia Valley. Cyan didn't know on what basis he would measure his worth yet. He thought he just needed to increase his physical strength as much as possible in the given time. He believed he was still weaker than his peers, but at least he was fortunate enough to retain the same combat sense as before regressing. With a small amount of magical sense, he thought that if he trained his body according to his ability, he could make good use of it. So, he intended to start from that moment. Soon, someone abruptly opens the door and puts their hand on their hip in a judgmental gesture. The person is a very beautiful woman named Alice. She then grabs the protagonist by the collar, ignoring her maid's welcoming remarks, and asks Cyan if he's crazy. After leaving Cyan almost lifeless on the ground, she says it seems Krantz's defeat got to his head and that it won't work. Alice then invites the boy to go with her to the roof illuminated by the duchy's lights, and they face each other. Alice says that now they will begin as soon as she unsheathes her sword. She tells him she'll let him go to the front lines if he can endure her for three minutes. Cyan asks if they really have to go that far. She says she wasn't hearing anything. He was the one who had to answer a question whether he was after the family title. Cyan wonders what she's talking about, he wasn't interested at all. Alice then prepares to unsheathe her sword. Due to his delayed response, she imagines that's the case and instructs him to draw his sword. Cyan then takes the foil out of its sheath, thinking it hadn't even been half a day since the duel against Krantz. That day was chaotic. Alice then charges at Cyan, who still seemed unprepared, and the first clash of swords occurs. She is completely surprised because he blocked her blow, even though he's only ten years old. Cyan struggles, wondering if his sister is really attacking with all her might against her brother, who is seven years younger. She then steps back to avoid being open to an attack. She thinks that a foil has a very light blade, and yet he cleanly defended an attack from a longsword. She wonders if he was lucky that time. She gives a forced smile, hiding her anger, and says he had better intuition than she thought. He seemed to recognize that smile, and it seemed to symbolize danger. She then quickly advances against him, who can barely defend himself. She soon raises the sword in what would be her absolute blow. The young man blocks his sister's blow in time, but they end up breaking each other's defenses. However, Alice ends up at a disadvantage with a foil almost cutting her throat. The fate of her younger brother is now in her hands. However, Cyan also seemed worried. He tightens his foil and jumps back in retreat, ending up on a small parapet. He thinks it could have ended very badly if he hadn't twisted the sword halfway. He would have killed Alice. His mist fencing technique, Thick Mist, mainly consists of skills aimed at killing the target immediately. It was difficult to fight without killing because he didn't have enough strength. 
Cyan wonders how much is left of the three minutes and then tightens his foil. He was trying to compensate for his weak strength by infusing his sword with mana, but he was almost at his limit. Alice then summons elements like earth and air, asking them to serve as her swords. Cyan recognizes his sister's words. As a sixth star magic, she then summons her aqua blade. He laments, asking if she wanted to kill him. He thought it was a test. He thought things were over. He could only see it in her eyes. He then raises his guard but thinks he would fall from the castle even if he blocked it. He then thought he just needed to trust that what he was going to do would work. He then charges towards her, who was preparing a devastating blow against her younger brother. He approaches, lifting the foil in his assassination style. Seeing his sister taken by the moment, ready to kill him, he asks his elken blade to please come out. But when the two were close to killing each other, the knight assigned to protect Cyan grabs the boy by the collar and blocks Alice. The shock of Alice's attack with the knight's blade creates a shimmering light throughout the palace. The knight tells Alice, while holding his younger brother like a kitten, that she was being too aggressive against such a young opponent. Cyan smiles in relief as he was already wondering how he must look. Alice is surprised to see that the knight's blade left hers damaged. Alice embraces her brother, apologizing for losing her composure during the battle. Tearfully, she admits that she only wanted to prevent him from going to the battlefield because he was too obsessed with it. He smiles, thinking it's just like her, always putting in effort. His sister was the cream of the crop, always getting straight A's in all subjects. In the Royal Academy, where all talented children gathered, be it in swordsmanship, magic, or other areas of study, she stood out. Additionally, her beauty was stunning, earning her the title of Child of God by people. Even at a young age, she was trained in swordsmanship. She was mentioned as the future guardian of the continent, alongside the eldest son, Ashel Vert. But not long after joining the Knights of Light, she was killed. This makes him hug his sister tighter, thinking about how much he missed her and that he would protect her this time. She doesn't understand her brother's sudden affection. Alice then looks at the knight and recognizes him as the duke's guardian. She questions why he's there since the duke had just left for war. The knight says he was following the duke's orders to protect the young master for a while, although he couldn't disclose why, as it was a secret. But Cyan had sensed his presence since leaving the duke's office. Cyan asks if he wouldn't have revealed himself if he continued to go unnoticed. But he wonders why his father told Elkin to keep it a secret. Alice realizes her brother has fallen asleep in her arms. She sighs, looking affectionately at her brother. He was still a child after all. The next day, Alice returned to the academy. Apparently, she returned briefly to see her father before graduating. Meanwhile, Cyan trained in his room to get stronger. He felt the need to become stronger, so he had focused on strength training for the past two weeks. But his limit was still only ten. It seemed like he was just hitting a wall these past two weeks. He was quite confident in his strength. Still, the gap between his dream physique saddened the protagonist. He needed a solution. Soon, his mate arrives, saying a package from Miss Alice had arrived, news that pleases him. She asks what it could be, as it smelled so bad. Cyan thinks it's hellhound blood, he asked her to get for him a rare item that can only be found in the Lemia Valley. But he believed the rumors about it being on the black market were true. Demon beast blood is considered poisonous due to its nauseating smell. He starts pouring it onto a plate, contemplating the burning sensation after consumption. However, he thinks that it permanently increases a person's strength. Most people think it's just a false rumor. He then takes the plate, still reluctant, but he knew the effects were worth it from his past experiences. His maid covers her nose, asking if he's really going to drink that. He confirms it, thinking to Emily not to worry. He's the only one who managed to adapt to her culinary skills. Cyan then gulps down the plate, all the while thinking about Emily's mushroom soup that stopped his heart with a single bite. Compared to that soup, this was nothing. He slams the plate on the table, saying it's good. He then calls Emily, saying he wants to take a walk. It's time to test if the blood worked. He leaves the duchy's premises. 
Arriving in the forest, he thinks it's been a while since he came there. He had been waiting for this day for the past two weeks, as Elkin wasn't around to give his regular reports. Cyan then remembers that he used to come to this place when he wanted to be alone. But then one day, Ashel received the divine revelation from the god of light, Lumendal. The god said an ancient temple was hidden somewhere in those mountains. Cyan didn't fully believe it, but there was indeed a place where the mana flow was concentrated. Of course, the daily revelation hadn't happened yet, but Cyan was already touching the ground, trying to sense the mana concentration. He says with a demonic look that, at the moment, he was the only one who knew about it. He then starts making his mana forcefully infiltrate the ground, making it open up. He smiles confidently, imagining that Ashel would have no idea what he was doing now. Chunks of the ground fall away, revealing a staircase leading down to a place with a strong light, and he prepares to descend. While descending the cave stairs, he thinks everything is different from the last time he was there. Cyan recalls that this place was an ancient temple dedicated to the god of light, Lumendal, until the entire history of the land was erased due to the war between gods and demons that happened 300 years ago. He then sees the temple and a light in the distance, just as he imagined that place existed in the mountains just behind the castle. He can see a sword in the temple, and as he approaches, he realizes it's the sword his brother used to kill him. We're taken back to the year 999 before the Foundation, on August 12th. Humanity had finally managed to expel the Demon King's army from Velias. The Demon King's army was much stronger than humans, but humans found ancient relics called Divine Armaments. These armaments allowed them to achieve victory. One of these relics, during Dark, was a sword blessed by the God of Light. That sword was considered the main cause of humanity's victory against the demons. Cyan also remembers that he will encounter it in his death in the future, when it's in his brother's hands. While looking at the sword up close, he thinks that maybe Durin Dark has something to do with his regression. He gently touches it, closes his eyes, but nothing happens as he expected. Then Cyan kicks Durin Dark off its pedestal, saying it ruined his mood because it wasn't as sacred as it seemed. He decides to take care of business and leave afterward. Once you pass through the light, there's a shadow that seems somewhat supernatural, and soon he finds the shadow of the sacred sword. He crouches down, and at first glance, it does seem like the shadow of the sacred sword, but something is impossible about it, and Cyan knows it. Cyan begins to manifest his power on the shadow's pedestal, because where there is light, there must be darkness. A path is revealed from the shadow, leading to another room, the Altar of Light. He descends and opens the door slowly. In the underground altar, he sees his old sword. He says it's good to see her as he grabs the hilt. He pulls it out. It was the demonic sword Karam. He smiles and greets his blade as he wields it. It's like she's a woman. But he is disappointed when he shakes the blade and finds that it hasn't awakened yet. But soon, the sword starts emitting energy, and he smiles foolishly, feeling a familiar sensation. He wants to kill something right now to test it. Soon, a mist begins to manifest, asking if Cyan isn't afraid. He wonders if the entity knows what it means, but Cyan dismisses it and asks if the sword is his or not. The shadow, with a malevolent appearance, says he has awakened the malicious sword and warns him with a sharp smile that it's too late to regret. The boy's body is now hers, and then she attacks the boy, but Cyan grabs her by the neck, holding her back with strength. Cyan says with a malicious smile that the entity isn't as reckless as the first time. The entity wonders who he is and how he can touch her while staring into Cyan's frightening eyes. He reminds her that he told her he is now her sword. The entity shows its claws and tries to tear Cyan's face, but all it manages to do is recoil. The entity now takes the form of a very beautiful woman, asking who he is and questioning how he can touch her. While looking into Cyan's scary eyes, she wonders who he is. He reminds her that he told her he is now her sword. The entity now shows her claws and tries to tear Cyan's face, but all she manages to do is move away. Now in the form of a beautiful woman, she asks who Cyan is and if he's the successor, sensing Eris' aura in him. 
he confirms that he is a descendant of Eris and smiles, saying the master is back, addressing her by name, the demonic sword Karen. She grits her teeth, thinking he's just a child, and starts attacking him incessantly because she can't accept it. Thyan realizes that words alone won't work. The ultimate goal of the demonic sword is to take control of the user's body. He has no choice but to take it slowly. She continues trying to attack him, but he smiles and activates the control of the demonic sword. Karen ends up falling to the ground, feeling the pressure of the control. Cyan announces he'll say it only once and asks why she won't just accept him as her owner while he's still being nice. But Karen thinks it's just arrogance on Cyan's part. He then uses control, making her fall to the ground over and over again, and then asks her what she thinks now. She ends up accepting after having her head stuck in the ground. He threatens once more, and she decides to call him master. He says that now that he's done what he came to do, they can go back. He's been out for too little. The sword says it's been a long time since she breathed fresh air and manifests in an aura, saying it's very refreshing. She then reaches Cyan's shoulder and asks for his name. He introduces himself as Cyan, Cyan Vert. Karen asks if Eris really chose a child like him because she has never heard the name in her life. He confirms, but in his past life. Karen asks what the hell he's talking about when he mentioned his previous life. He then says he already died once, leaving Karen a bit confused. Arriving at Ashel's sword, Karen asks if she's asleep, and Cyan says she'll have to wait another twenty years for her owner. Karen says he talks as if Cyan knows what will happen in the future. He then reaches out with the sword, cuts the hilt into two pieces, leaving Karen quite surprised. She wonders what Cyan intends to do with the piece he collected from the sword's hilt, while the sword releases a small amount of energy, as if in revolt. Cyan gives an evil smile, saying that maybe that piece of the hilt could make things a bit more interesting in the future, making his brother's life harder and changing the course of how things will end.